Welcome to the validation section. So we've seen so far several different predictors which given a, an x can predict for us what the corresponding value of y should be. And I want to talk now about how we're going to evaluate different predictors. We have seen k nearest neighbors predictors, we've seen tree based predictors, we've seen neural network predictors, we've seen linear predictors. And so somebody's come along and said, well, here's my favorite predictor, which I designed. And uh, you've got to decide, well, should I use that predictor or should I use some other predictor? So one of the key ideas is that we need a, what's called a performance metric. And what it is, is it's a measure of how large prediction errors are. And so what we can do is we can say, well, we've got a data set, x1 through xn and y1 through yn. And for each one of those data points, we can evaluate the predictor g at the ith data point xi to get a prediction y hat i. And ask the question, how close is y hat i to y i? And the performance metric is going to be the measure of how close y hat i is to y i. And normally it's designed so that the smaller the metric, the better the prediction performance. It's an error measure. Some people call the prediction performance metric the prediction error as a result. So there are a few which are very commonly used. The first one is the mean square error. So this here uh, is the two norm. Let me just mark it here. See the subscript two there. What it means is it means, means the following. If you give me a vector x, then that's equal to the sum from i is 1 up to n x i squared or square rooted. And the subscript 2 there indicates which particular norm we are using. Um, there are other norms that we might use with different subscripts. So for example, we might use the 1 norm, which is just the absolute value of each of the components of x added up. And we'll see a few other norms in this class, as well as a few other performance metrics in this class. So if y i is a vector, an m-dimensional vector, then if you give me a particular y i and a, and a particular corresponding prediction y hat i, I can compute its two norm as uh, a measure of the error between y hat and y i. And then I can average those up and um, uh, so sum those up and divide by n and that would be a, a prediction performance metric. And of course if y i is just a scalar, so m is 1, then that's just the mean square error, the mean square difference between y i and y hat i. Very often, instead of working with the mean square error, we work with the root mean square error. That is the square root of 1 on n multiplied by the sum from i is 1 to n of y hat i minus y i squared, uh, which is uh, convenient because it has the same units as y. And uh, uh, another uh, very useful uh, error metric or performance metric is the mean absolute error. So that's 1 on n, the sum from i is 1 to n of the absolute value of y hat i minus y of i. If you have scalar positive y's, then we define the mean fractional error 
as the average of the absolute value of y hat i minus y i divided by the minimum of y hat i and y i. And this is something like an average percentage error. If y hat i is greater than y i, then the absolute value of y hat i minus y i divided by the minimum of y hat i and y i is the percentage by which y hat i is greater than y i. There are many other common performance metrics. Uh, the median error um, uh, is another one that's very commonly used and we'll see many others in this class. So now that we've got a prediction performance metric that allows us to compare different predictors on a particular data set. So, for example, we might conclude that k nearest neighbors with k is 7 does better than k nearest neighbors with k is 12. Or we might conclude that a particular neural network does better than a particular linear model. Um, several things to notice about these kinds of conclusions. They depend on several things. First of all, they depend on the performance metric. It is quite reasonable and quite common that you can have a predictor that does better on one performance metric, but does worse in a different performance metric. So the neural network may do better than the linear model when using the RMS error, but may do worse than the linear model when using the mean absolute error. So you've got to choose the performance metric carefully so that it corresponds to something that you actually care about. Uh, another important thing to notice about performance metrics and using them for uh, analysis of predictors is that they are predictor agnostic. And that's a very good thing. It means that when we evaluate the performance of a predictor, we're not evaluating it using the same software that was used to develop it. We're not evaluating it on the basis of the properties of the learning algorithm we're evaluating it on some objective notion of performance, and anybody's predictor could be evaluated using the same performance measure. So if somebody else has a method of generating a predictor, even if you don't know what that method is, you can evaluate their predictor by evaluating the quality of their predictions. And all that should matter is whether or not their predictions do better, are better, the predictions given by some other predictor. A third thing to notice about uh, comparing predictors using a performance metric is that it depends on the data set. And so all you can do is you can use the performance metric to evaluate the performance of a predictor on a particular data set. And that leads us to the question of generalization. Suppose we have a predictor and it performs well on the data set that we use to train it. Can we conclude that it's going to perform well on uh, a data set that it's never seen before, unseen data? And if it does, that's called generalization. Generalization is the ability of a predictor to perform well on unseen data. And unseen here means that the data was not used to create the prediction model. It was not part of the learning data set. The person who developed the predictor never looked at that data when they were developing the predictor. So we'd like to answer the question of when we can infer that good performance of a predictor on one data set implies that the, the predictor will perform well on a second data set. And in order to do that, one would need to make some probabilistic assumptions. For example, one might say that both sets of data are samples from some underlying probability distribution. With some kind of probabilistic assumptions like that, we might well be able to conclude that performance on one data set says something about performance on another data set. For example, if we have 
two sets of data both sampled from the same distribution, we might reasonably conclude that the mean of the first set of data and the mean of the second set of data should be very close, provided we have enough data. So there is a framework for doing this kind of analysis. We will not discuss it in this class. It's a more advanced topic. But instead, what we will see is we will see some practical methods, some methods for actually assessing whether or not the prediction that you've got actually generalizes. The fundamental thing to do, of course, if you want to know whether your predictor generalizes to a new set of data is to try it out on a new set of data. And so we think about having two sets of data. One we call the training data or the in-sample data. And that's the data set that we use in order to construct the predictor. And then we have another set of data, which we call the out-of-sample data. That's the unseen data on which we're going to test the performance of the predictor. And if the predictor performs well on this unseen data, we say the predictor generalizes. It makes good predictions on data it has never seen. If it doesn't, we say it fails to generalize. It's overfit. This terminology overfit is quite evocative and we will have much more to say about it. Okay, here is a simple example. This is data downloaded from the federal government. Uh, these, this plot shows the number of vehicle miles traveled in each year over a range of years from 1970 to 2005. And so vehicle miles traveled is the total number of miles traveled over the year by all of the vehicles. Um, and on the left here, we have a subset of the data. We have 12 data points. I will just highlight right there. And what we do with those 12 data points is we fit a straight line predictor. Y hat is theta 1 plus theta 2 times x, where y hat is our prediction of the number of vehicle miles traveled, and x is the year. And we'll just choose those parameters using least squares. That gives us this nice straight line fit here, which goes all the way up there. And then we can say, well, um, let's look at the rest of the data, the data that we held aside. We, t we only fit this uh, straight line using 12 blue sample points. We've got another 14 data points. Those are these 14 data points right here. And we can see that those 14 data points actually lie rather close to the straight line fit. And so the predictor actually does generalize to those additional points. Of course, in this simple example, you can plot it all and see it all by eye. It's very simple in two dimensions. Uh, and of course, we'd like to be able to work with very large data sets in a very large number of dimensions where it's no longer possible to do such simple plots. Well, that's why we need to use the tool of a prediction error metric, prediction performance metric, in order to evaluate how well the, perform the predictor is doing on these different data sets. Now there's a specific approach to doing this. In fact, there are several specific approaches to doing this kind of analysis. The first one is called out of sample validation. And that goes like this. Very often we don't have data sets which are naturally fall into two categories, data that we use to uh, do the training and data that we use to test. And so what we do is we split the data. And so we'll download some data set. It may be a whole bunch of images and we'd like to develop a predictor that can uh, look at an image and tell us whether that's a cat or that's a dog. 
and um, uh, we take this data and we divide the data into two data sets, a training set and a test set. And often we do that randomly, so we we'll might use 80, uh, an 80 20 split where 80% of the points we use for training and 20% we use for test. Uh, we might use 90 10, it doesn't really matter very much. The exact uh, split is not very important and the results are quite insensitive to that. What we do with the training set is we train the predictor, we use it to choose the predictor. And then the test set is used to validate the predictor, to evaluate how well the predictor performs using the particular performance metric we've decided upon. And as a result, you have an honest test. You have an honest simulation of how the predictor works on unseen data. And we hope that because it worked well on data that was not used to train it, it will also work well on other unseen data that we haven't seen yet at all. And this hope is founded on the assumption that all of this data looks kind of the same. The data that we used for training, the data that we're using for testing, and future unseen data, they're all kind of similar. Uh, very often we do this split in a random way uh, for two reasons. Um, one is, is that we want to get the training right. And so um, if I'm, for example, outside taking photographs of cats and dogs in the hope to develop a predictor that can tell the difference between them, well, during the day the sun might go down, the clouds might come over, it might the, become quite overcast, the conditions can change quite significantly. And so if I simply take the last 20% of the images, then I could end up with a test set, which is all cloudy images, and a training set, which is all sunny images. And that will both upset my training. It could well be that my predictor will not learn how to distinguish cats and dogs under cloudy conditions, but only under sunny conditions. And it will upset my, upset my test in that all I will be doing is testing the predictor in cloudy conditions and I won't measure the performance in sunny conditions. So the, the fact that you make this split random helps to avoid these kinds of uh, uh, biases and errors which are a result of uh, a particular ordering of the data in the data set. Now what matters is the performance on the test set. Uh, the training set performance doesn't mm, really matter at all. Um, we expect it to be good. And in fact, we usually expect the, uh, the training performance to be better than the test performance. Um, usually the test performance is only a little bit worse than the training performance. Um, sometimes the test performance is still okay, but actually quite a lot worse than the training performance. That's fine. If the test performance is okay, that's what matters. You can be in a situation where the training performance is perfect. For example, one nearest neighbor's predictor. The one nearest neighbor's predictor, if you give it an element of the training set, one of the XIs, it predicts the corresponding YI corresponding to that XI because that is the closest X to that XI. And so it gets zero error on the training set. But it still makes useful predictions even for uh, data that's not in the training set. But the training error is no indicator of how well it will do on the test set. So let's look at how we interpret validation results. We have two measurements. The first is the performance on the test set. That's really what matters. And the second is the performance on the training set. That doesn't matter. And so we get four numbers. We'll plot these in a table here. In the first column, we have the training error. We have small training error. And in the second column, we have large training error. 
and in the first row we have small test error and in the second row we have large test error. So this top left entry here is really good news. It means we got small test error and small training error. So it performs well when we did our training and then when we tried it out on data we haven't seen before it did well there too and so it generalizes. It is possible to be over here to be in the case where we have small test error but large training error. That is luck or perhaps we've cheated and there's some kind of fraud involved. Um, it doesn't happen very often because one does the training and one sees large training error and typically doesn't even bo we don't even bother to try it against unseen data if we can't get it to work on data that we can see. We're probably not going to get it to work on data that we can't see. Um, so this doesn't happen very often. Uh, if we have large test error, the bottom row, well then there's two possible explanations. One is we're, um, we have small training error, but we had large test error. Um, this is the failure to generalize. We thought we developed a good predictor. It seemed to do well when we were training it. Um, but then we tested it on data we've never seen before and it didn't do well. Um, we would say such a predictor is overfit. And then the worst case of all, we have large training error and large test error. It generalizes okay. You know, it does the same thing on the test data that it does on the, the training data. But it doesn't do very well on the training data. So how do we choose between different candidate predictors? Two people come along, they've both, they're both experts in machine learning and they come to us with their predictors, but they've developed them using completely different methods. We don't even get to see their code. We can do validation. We take their predictors and we try their predictors on data that they've never seen before. And typically what we're going to do is we're going to choose the predictor amongst all of those candidates which has the smallest test error. That's not always what we do because sometimes we're willing to back off a little bit on that requirement. We might accept a little bit larger test error if that gives us a particularly simpler predictor. Uh, there are good reasons for this and we will have more to say on this later. Well, let's look at a particular example. Here is simply a one-dimensional example. Um, we have a, a, a data set with 30 data points, um, 20 of which we'll use for training and 10 of which we'll use as the test set. Here on this plot we see 20 blue points, those are the training set, and 10 red points. So here is the performance of two of our favorite classes of predictors on that data set. Here on the top row we have the k nearest neighbor predictors when k is 1, 2, and 3. And on the bottom row we have the affine predictor, the quadratic predictor, and the cubic predictor. We can see right here that the in the in the top left plot the k nearest neighbors when predictor when k is 1 does perfectly on the training data. Let me just highlight that. It passes perfectly through the blue data points. If I look at the k is equal to 2 plot, well that doesn't pass perfectly through all the data points, but it's a bit smoother than the k is equal to 1. And k is equal to 3 also doesn't pass through all the data points, but it's a little bit smoother then k is equal to 2. Now the affine predictor here, that's the best straight line fit. Here's the quadratic predictor and here's the cubic predictor. Just looking at these
Now let's look at the RMS performance error. So we're using the RMS error here as the performance metric. And we could say, well, which is the best prediction model? Some things to highlight. Well, first of all, that number right there is zero. The k nearest neighbors predictor when k is equal to one does perfectly on the training data. Um, doesn't when we increase k is equal to two to k is equal to three, actually the performance gets worse on the training data. Um, and on the test data, it changes a little bit. It goes from 0.1 when k is 1 to 0 0.08 when k is 2, back up to 0.1 when k is 3. When we look at the polynomial predictors, we see something which is quite interesting. With an affine predictor on the training data, we have 0 0.08. And then when we go to the quadratic predictor, the error decreases. This has to happen because we're optimizing over the best possible quadratic predictor. And of course, an affine predictor is a quadratic predictor. It's just a very special one. And so the quadratic predictor is comparing all possible quadratics, including all the affines. And, and so it has to do at least as well as the best affine predictor. So when we go from affine to quadratic, the performance has to get better. And the same when we go from quadratic to cubic. Every quadratic predictor is a cubic predictor. And so the best cubic predictor must do at least as well as the best quadratic predictor. And so the, tra the training error has to decrease as we go from affine to quadratic to cubic. That, those statements aren't true for the test data. We do see that as we go from affine to quadratic to cubic, that the performance on the test data does get better. But there's no guarantee that that would happen. It doesn't have to happen. So out of all of these predictors, which one has the best test error is this one right here. That's noticeably better. That's the cubic predictor, its test error is 0 0.025. The next comparable ones are the quadratic predictor and the two nearest neighbor predictor. But those are substantially worse at 0 0.08. So we might decide to go for the best, the, the cubic predictor, which does well in test and it does well in train. And so it both performs well and generalizes well. We have the k nearest neighbor with k is equal to 1, which performs well on the train but doesn't generalize so well. Let's look more generally at polynomial fits. So suppose we have a scalar u and scalar v as our raw data. And then we use a feature mapping where we construct x's from u's by x is equal to phi of u. And for each u, we construct a d-dimensional vector consisting of the powers of u. 1, u, u squared, up to u to the power of d minus 1. And then we're going to construct a linear predictor, g of x, theta transpose x, a linear combination of those d monomials, a polynomial of degree d minus 1. And we're going to choose the theta by least squares. And here's the kind of thing that we see. Here we have 60 data points, and um, we are looking at the predictors with d is equal to 6 on the left, in the middle d is equal to 12, and on the right d is equal to 14. So these are degree 5, degree 11, and degree 13 polynomial fits of the data. Um, now if we look at the RMS error, the one that has the smallest RMS error is the degree 13 plot. And that's not surprising at all for the same reason the cubic did better than the quadratic in the previous example. 
the degree 13 has to do better than the degree 11, which has to do better than the degree 5 against the training data. Now we'll take those same 60 data points and we'll split the data points into 48 training points and 12 test points. Now for each degree D, between here we've got degrees between 0 and 14, what we're going to do is we're going to train a predictor on the 48 data points. And then we'll compute two numbers. It's RMS error on the training set and it's RMS error on the test set. So for degree two, that's this number and this number. And then we do it again, say at degree four, and we end up with this number and this number. We expect that the training error is going to be less, it's going to be less than the test error. And it is at every different degree that we see here. But it doesn't have to be that way. These two, cur these two plots can certainly cross. Um, it usually happens that we do better in training than we do in tests, but not always. Now, what happens on the training set as you increase the degree is that training error has to decrease. Increasing the class of functions, increasing the set of functions over which we're optimizing means we're going to get better fits. And so you can see that every time we increase degree, the training error decreases. The test error certainly doesn't have to and it doesn't. Now if you just looked at the training error, you might conclude we should conclude we should use a degree as high as possible. So we should use D is equal to uh, 15 here. And uh, uh, however, if you look at the test error, that suggests quite a different story. That suggests that we should use degree five. What's happening out here to the right is we're seeing overfitting. We're seeing predictors that are doing really well on the training data, but much less well on the test data. Let's look at our plots again. So here we can see it. You can just about see that really these data is kind of noisy and there's plots, points scattered everywhere. But here we've seen these little wiggles showing up. Let's look at our polynomial fit again to see if we can see evidence of overfitting. So there's two things that show up on this plot that are interesting. One is, is that there seems to be quite a lot of noise in the data. What do I mean by that? If we look at just a particular region, let's look at this region. If I look at x's within this region here, then we can see that vertically the value of y still tends to have some variability. It's not a smooth curve like the predictor would have us believe, but instead the points jiggle up and down a lot. And that suggests that those points come about, that variation in those vertical position of those points comes about due to noise. Now, what's happening with regard to our predictor? Our predictor is doing something interesting. Our predictor in this degree 5 plot is just sort of averaging out the noise. It's doing something rather gentle. It's just moving gently through the center of the cloud of the points. But this predictor over here 
at degree 13, we can see that it's starting to wiggle. And the reason it's starting to wiggle is that it's starting to believe in the noise. It's starting to try and fit the noise. And this is what we mean by overfitting. The learning algorithm is fitting a predictor to features of the training data which are due to noise or variation which isn't present in the test set. And that's what we see, is that as we move down here, we're getting better and better fit as we fit more and more closely the features in the training data. But the reality is, is that with test data, we're going to move up here and we're going to find that those features don't actually exist in the test data and they are going to give us greater error in the test data then we are led to believe by the performance in the training data. Now we can do several more, slightly more sophisticated things than simply split the data into a test set and a training set. One extension is to split the data more ways. So we split the data into k different subsets. We'll call them k folds of the data. And this is called k fold cross validation. And so we have k different buckets of data, k different subsets of the data. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through that's the sets of data. And the first time we fit, so let's draw, say, put respect, suppose k is 5, and then we'll have five different subsets of the data. There's 1, there's 2, there's 3, there's 4, and there's 5. The first time we fit, we will fit using those four, and we'll test using that one. The second time we fit, we will, we will fit using this one, those four and test using that one. The third time we'll fit using those four and test using that one and so on. So we'll have each time we do a run we will train using four out of our five buckets of data and we're going to test using the other bucket of the data. As a result we get rather than having just one test error and one training error, we have five different training errors and five different corresponding test errors. These five different test errors we can look at. We can work out the mean test error, the standard deviation of the test errors, and just get a sense of the variation. If they're all small, then we can feel rather confident that actually this predictor does well. Conversely, if there's a whole lot of variability, then we start to feel a little less confident. And of course, we haven't really got one predictor. We're going to have, if k is 5, five different predictors. And so we can look at the different thetas, the different predictor parameters. If they're all very similar, that's another reason to feel confident that our methods are giving us a certain amount of uniformity. We're getting the same predictor for each one of our different subsets of the data. On the other hand, if the predictor parameters vary wildly, well, then we're less confident that we've got a sensible choice of predictor coming out of our method. Here's an example. Uh, this is just randomly generated data. Um, you can see here on the left we have fitted a, uh, a straight line through the data. So that's determined by two parameters, theta1 plus theta2 times x is the predictor. And, uh, and then we, do, we split the data five ways and do five-fold cross-validation. That gives us five different results, each of which is a training loss and a has a training loss and a test loss. And we can see that well, typically, 
the test loss oh, is not that different from the training loss. That's a good sign right there. And uh, there's some variability in the test loss. The test, smallest test loss we see here is 0 0.0027. The largest test loss is 0 0.0071. But this, that's either way, it's still very small. The theta parameters, we will also see some variability there, in particular in theta 1, but it's rather a small number again. It's going to be 0 0.003 up to 0 0.012 up to minus 0 0.012 and theta 2 is about 1. You can see that of course when we plot the different predictors. Each of the different predictors, those are really five different plots here on this curve. There are really five lines on top of each other but they're all so close to each other that we can't really tell the difference. Of course, when you're in high dimensions, you can't necessarily plot your predictors, but you can look at theta 1 and the, the different theta parameters, and you can look at the training loss and the test loss. We might want to be even more confident than simply having five different results. Here's how you might do that. You take the data and split it into a training and test split, say 80-20, but completely randomly train the predictor using the training data, and then evaluate the predictor on the test data. And then repeat it again a thousand different times. So here's how you gain, might gain a little bit more confidence. You might split the data into a training and test split, say 80-20, randomly. Then you train the predictor using the training data and you evaluate it on the test data. Now you repeat that a thousand times. And then you'll have a thousand different test errors. You can plot the histogram of those test errors and see how much variation is there. And we can see right here that the mean test error in this example is about 0 0.05. And if we look back to our previous data, that's not that inconsistent between where we see saw errors between 0 0.027 and 0 0.071, and a couple here around 0 0.05. And so really we can be confident that when we try this on new test data, we would expect to see something around 0 0.05, at least if our of our entire data set is representative of unseen data. And we can also see that there's going to be some variation even with a data set the size that we have. We're going to see, sometimes we're going to see some significant test errors of 0 0.015, 0 0.02. Okay, one last topic in this section, and that is what do you do once you've chosen a predictor? Well, one thing you have to be careful of is that you've revisited this test set too many times. Even if you kept one test set in escrow, you trained based on the, on the training set, and then you evaluated your predictor on the test set, and you decided that the predictor wasn't very good. Well, suddenly, you're taking information from that test set and using it in your training procedure. And when you do it again and again and again, information is leaking from the test set into your training procedure. You're learning based in part on the test set. And so it's no longer a really honest simulation of how well the model would do on data you've never seen. Of course, there's a trick to avoid this, and the trick to avoid this is to split the original data instead of into two data sets, into three data sets. A training set, that's how we fit multiple candidate models. A validation data set, which we evaluate the performance of our models on. And then a test data set, which is pristine, it's untouched. We keep it to one side, and we never look at it. Or we look at it once. That tells us how well we've done but then we don't go back and change our predictor once we've looked at it. 
Um, this, of course, is a little bit more honest. Um, uh, it, some people would say that it's, it's taking it to extremes. Um, and this really depends on how much leakage of information there is from your test set into your training set, from your validation set into your training set. Now, some practitioners do this, others do not. Also, the names of test and validation are not really well settled. Some people reverse the terminology and refer to the pristine set as the validation set and the test set as the thing that's used to evaluate the performance of models. In this course, we won't go to this extreme. We'll simply use one test set and one validation set. And uh, we'll use out of sample or five fold cross validation. One more thing you can do is that you're satisfied. At the end of the day, you've, de you've done train validation and test, and you've got a predictor that you're pretty happy with. Now you could just stop there and say, that's a predictor. We're going to use it, and we're happy with it. Another thing you can do is you can say, well, what we've really validated is not the predictor, but the procedure, the learning algorithm, which we're using to develop the predictor. And so why not just take that learning algorithm, which we're happy with, and now apply it to the whole data set so that it can learn from all of the data we have, not just the piece that we used for training. And that is a very common practice. Um, and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It works very well. Uh, many people do this. Um, so, for example, you might train uh, k nearest neighbor predictors for various values of k. Uh, validation suggests that k is 6 is a good choice. Now, the final predictor you supply is a k nearest neighbor predictor with k is 6, but it uses all of the data. Okay, in this section, we've talked about evaluating predictors. In the previous section, we talked about different predictors that we could have. Um, we've yet to talk about how you might make predictors and how you might learn, and that's, of course, coming in this class. But right now, you're in a position where if somebody gives you a predictor, you can decide whether it's good or not. But also, you're in a position where the stage for, the cor for this course has been set. We know what we're trying to do now with this class. We're trying to develop predictors. We know how, once we've got predictors, how we're going to evaluate them, how we're going to tell good predictors from bad predictors. And what's next is to go ahead and make some. <laughs>